All right, this morning we are uh, looking at uh, Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 8. And what I'd like to do is read it in the context because uh, I, I, I believe that sometimes when we read this passage, we get the impression that it's really talking about trusting the Lord in all of our different situations and all of His providences that we need to trust Him. And certainly we need to do that. I'm not saying the verse doesn't address that. But I think more particularly what Solomon is, is telling us here is that we need to trust what the Lord says. We need to trust His Word. We need to basically use it as the roadmap for our lives to keep us on the right path, to keep us in the path of safety and the path of, of blessing. Uh, remembering, too, as we're going to look at this evening and, and just touch on at the end of the sermon, that when we get off the path, that the reason why the Lord sends discipline is to get us back on the path because this is the only place of safety. We need to remember we cannot trust our own wisdom, our own decision-making process. We can't just draw upon our own knowledge. We need to draw upon the Word of God. We need to use His wisdom. If that's the wisdom we're using, we will be safe. But let's, let's go ahead and begin reading this passage in context. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Solomon writes, my, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. And turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Well, may the Lord bless um, his, his word to our, our hearing this morning. As you know, we've been looking at uh, some of the many reasons that we should obey the Lord. And one of the reasons why we're spending so much time on this is because it's very important. But it's also because of uh, just how things are in, in our society today. Uh, the idea of submitting or obeying anyone is, I think, is one that we all resist to one degree or another, even when it comes to obedience to the Lord. We need to bear in mind that we are influenced by our culture. We, we tend to draw our norms from the culture, and we can transfer those things to our Christianity, but we need to be careful not to do that. We have all been affected by the world to one degree or, degree or another. We've all grown up in this culture that resists authority, we need to be uh, careful. By the way, our culture also tends not to take norms seriously. We need to take them seriously. That's a part of the, um, again, rejection of authority. Now, we are also, as we know from Scripture, influenced by the sin that is still in our hearts. And because of that, we're, we, we tend to grab on to the things that are in our culture because our sin agrees with it. We like our independence. We want to steer our own ship, as it were. But we've been seeing as believers how important it is that we reject the ideas of the world, that we not walk according to the prince of the power of the air, the God of this world, but that we listen to God and that we obey Him. There's a lot, of, a lot that's really riding on this, very important. For one thing, our eternal happiness depends, and really depended if we've already done this, on obeying His commandment to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, by the way, that's not a one-time act, is it? It's something that we started, but something we continue throughout our entire lives, every day trusting in the Lord, every day turning from our sins. 
If we had insisted on our independence, we would have lost our happiness forever. Uh, that we obey now is the evidence that we really do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is something else we've seen. I mean, the Spirit of God comes into our hearts and He changes our lives. John writes in 1 John 3, 7, Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Do you want to know whether or not you're a believer? Do you practice righteousness? Do you live according to God's plan, according to His will, according to His law? You know, again, law is a word that people don't like to hear today. Uh, it gets toned down, but these are commandments, and the Lord wants us to obey these. If we submit to this, if we obey Him, if, we, if that is the practice of our lives, we give ourselves to Him because that's what we want to do, because we love Him, it shows that we know Him. If, on the other hand, we give ourselves to sin, it shows just the opposite, again, John writes in 1 John 3, 9, no one who is born of God practices sin. And in verse 8, the one who practices sin is of the devil. Obedience is important. It shows where we're at spiritually, whether or not we belong to God. How much we obey determines how happy we are going to be in the future. Remember, if we want a greater reward... We need to give ourselves to obey Him more. And we also know that our fellowship with God, which isn't God's love for us as much as it is our sense of His love, our sense of nearness to Him, the joy and the blessing that comes from walking with Him subjectively, I think, and certainly objectively as well, depends largely on how well we obey. So obedience is important. Now, this morning, I wanted us to consider another reason why we should obey Him, why it's important that we obey Him, and that is because God knows better than we how we should live. He's wiser than we are. Now, when we want help with something that's really important to us, where do we go? I mean, we, we tend to go to those who know more about these things than we do, right? When we're sick, we go to the doctor, somebody who's an expert on how our bodies work. When we have dental issues, we go to the dentist because he knows what's going on with our teeth. When we have legal problems, we go to a lawyer, somebody who knows the law. But what do we do when it comes to living? You know, where should we go when we want to learn the best way to live? Well, sadly, we often don't go to the expert. Some never go anywhere. Some simply try to figure it out for themselves. They trust their own wisdom. Some go to their friends, to those who have the same level of experience or perhaps even less than they do. And again, that's what Rehoboam did. Remember, he went to his peers, to, no, to those he grew up with, to those who were his friends. He, he thought they were wise. But... He didn't go to the experts, and as a result, he lost over half of his kingdom. Solomon tells us that when we want to learn how to live, we need to go to the Lord, to the one who has infinite knowledge and wisdom. We need to go to his word because this is where he has spoken to us. He gave it to us to teach us how we are to live. We need to trust him to guide us through his word. Now, in verses 5 through 8, Solomon gives us really no less than six exhortations, six commandments, to trust the Lord. Now, he gives us the first two in verses 5 and 6. And, and the, this is the commandment put positively. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Now, let's just dissect particularly this first commandment. Notice, first of all, whom it is that Solomon tells us that we are to trust. He says, trust the Lord. Now, his name alone gives us at least four reasons why we should trust him. The first is perhaps the most obvious. He is the Lord. He has the authority to command us. God speaks and we listen. 
Now, Solomon wrote this, but remember, he wrote this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which means that this order ultimately does not come from him, but it comes from the Lord. And show, so we should do it. We should trust him. The second is that the Lord, being the author of creation with his unlimited knowledge and wisdom, made everything to work in a certain way. He made it to work in the right way. And he, above everyone else in the world, certainly knows how we should live for our well-being. Now, that's the second reason why we should trust him and not trust ourselves. Thirdly, the Lord is holy. Really, his character is the very definition of holiness. He, above everyone else, knows what righteousness is. And righteousness, of course, is what brings blessing. It's what gives length of days, a long life. Do you want blessing? Do you want a long life? You need to trust the Lord to show you how to live in order to gain those things. And then fourthly, his name, which is again the Lord or Yahweh, reminds us that he is our covenant God. He is the one who has entered into covenant with us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, when we were his enemies, he loved us so much that he was willing to give the one who was most precious to him to suffer and to die so that we might become his. And now that he has entered into covenant with us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, now that we are his people, his sons and his daughters, as a father, he desires nothing but what is best for us. The instruction that he gives us in his word is that of a loving father to his children. He wants things to go well. He wants us to be blessed in, in the sense that he really wants us to be blessed, which is to have a life that is pleasing to him, filled with his Holy Spirit, giving honor and glory to him. We should trust that the Lord has told us the right way to do it and not look anywhere else for that wisdom. You know, the name Yahweh literally translated, at least to the best of our knowledge, it essentially means this, the one who is, the, the eternal one, the one who is, the one who always will be, the one who never changes. And when we tie that into what it is we're looking at here, what it means is that his desire for our well-being and our happiness which, incredibly enough, he's concerned about. You know, that's the God we serve. He is never going to change. And so we should trust that he is always going to show us the right way to gain this well-being and this happiness. Now, what does it mean actually to trust the Lord? Well, the word itself means to have confidence that he will and has shown us the right way. It means to know for certain that what he tells us will be and is for our good. It means to rely on what he says and not on what anybody else says, no matter what it is we have to face. Now, I think when we're talking about trust, we've already seen. You've heard this expression, perhaps, what's called the sine qua non, which means that uh, that without which you cannot have something. Well, that's what trust is for the Christian life. Without trust, you cannot have life. You cannot have any kind of life. You can't have eternal life. There is no salvation without trust. We have to trust the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver us from judgment. Otherwise, we won't be saved. And again, let's remember what that means. It doesn't mean that I know about him. It doesn't mean that I believe that he did what he did. But what it means is I'm actually looking to him and relying on him, having confidence in him to, to save me from my sins. He is the reason I'm going to get to heaven. No other reason. We have to trust him. With no trust, there is no salvation. The Bible says further, we won't receive anything from him unless we trust that he is true to his word. Remember what James writes in James 1, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, and as we read on, this basically applies to anything else we might lack, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. 
For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You see, it doesn't honor the Lord when you don't trust what he says is true. I mean, God says, I promise if you, I'm going to give this to you if you will just believe that I'm going to do this. And we say, I, I don't know if you're, if you're trustworthy, Lord. I doubt that you're going to do this for me. God says, if that's the way you feel about it, you're not going to get anything. You need to believe him that he is trustworthy and that he will give you what he has promised. Solomon tells us that we're not going to make it safely through this world unless we trust him, have confidence in him, rely on him to guide us as he tells us in his word. Now, we are to trust in the Lord. How strong should that trust be? Well, again, in verse 5, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And what he means by that is with your whole inner man, with all the faculties of your soul, with your whole mind, with your whole will, with all your affections. Now, this kind of trust we call implicit trust, one that is complete, one that is absolute, one that doesn't doubt at all. By the way, this is what the Roman church tells its members to have in the priest, in the teaching ministry of the priesthood, that because their priests are teaching them what the church believes, what they believe to be God's truth, even if you don't understand it, you still need to believe it. That's what's called implicit faith. You trust them implicitly or absolutely. Well, Solomon tells us that this kind of trust is to be reserved for the Lord and the Lord alone. And even when we do not understand why the Lord tells us to do what he tells us to do, and I think sometimes that's true. We don't know why he says we should do this, that we should still do it because he's right and we're wrong. We need to trust that whatever he tells us is going to be for our good, even if we don't understand why he tells us to do it. So trust in the Lord implicitly with all your heart. Now the second command, in all your ways acknowledge him, is essentially the same thing as the first. He says we are to acknowledge, which means to know what the Lord directs and accept it as good. We are to acknowledge him in all of our ways, in all the decisions we make. Remembering that life is really nothing more than a series of choices, right? What direction we're going to go, uh, how we're going to respond to what comes our way, what other people do to us. As we are faced with all of these choices, Solomon says, acknowledge what the Lord says and make choices that are consistent with his word, trusting that his way is best. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Now, the second pair of commandments is really implied by the first. It's really kind of the opposite of the first. If we are to have this kind of trust in the Lord and in his wisdom, then we are not to trust the wisdom of others, not even our own, particularly not our own. Solomon writes in verses 5 and 7, do not lean on your own understanding. Now, that doesn't mean your own understanding of his word, unless, of course, that's wrong, but just your own understanding, what we call, what, uh, common sense. Common sense is not your guide. The Word of God is. And he goes on to say in verse 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Now, more often than not, this is exactly what we tend to do. We do what we think is right using common sense rather than acknowledging what God says is right. Now, Solomon also warns us that this way of thinking is ingrained in us as fallen humanity. He writes in Proverbs 21, verse 2, Every man's way is right in his own eyes. But he also warns us that if we follow our own way, it does not have a good outcome. He writes in Proverbs 16, verse 25, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. 
Now, our understanding, our experiences in life are very limited. That's why we should not trust ourselves and why we don't in other areas, why we turn to the experts in, in virtually all other areas but this particular one. We always turn to our common sense when it comes to how we should live, even though we go to the experts in other, at other times. Now, our experience is limited. That's why we shouldn't trust ourselves. But also, our hearts can deceive us. We need to realize there's still a lot of sin in our souls. We still want things that we shouldn't want. And we can so easily talk ourselves into things that aren't good for us. But when we do that, we're falling under that warning that Solomon said just a few moments ago. There's a way that seems right to us, but we're not going to like the end of it. We're not going to like the conclusion. We're not going to like where it leads us. The only way we can make sure we're going to go and end up in the right direction is we need to listen to the Lord. So we shouldn't trust our own judgments, and we need to remember that our peers, our friends, are, are in exactly the same boat we are. We shouldn't trust them either. Remember what happened to Rehoboam. Same thing can happen to us. Undoubtedly, it has happened to us before. Now, the final pair of commands points us back to the foundation of wisdom in chapter 3, verse 7. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Solomon tells us in chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is where wisdom starts. And he reminds us that there's really only two kinds of people that are in the world. Those who are wise, who fear the Lord, essentially who respect Him, who know who He is, who know what He's like, what it is that pleases Him, and who take Him seriously. That's what the fear of the Lord means, to respect Him and to listen to Him. But there are also those who are foolish, who do not fear the Lord and do not respect Him, such as the youth, again, that uh, counsel Rehoboam, who really know little or nothing about the Lord, what He's like or what pleases Him, and who certainly do not take Him seriously. Now, what difference does it make whether we fear the Lord or not? Well, you know what the Bible says. Those who do not fear the Lord, who continue to walk by their own wisdom, will eventually be destroyed because they're not going to turn to His Son in order to be saved. They're going to trust in themselves. My good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds. God isn't really concerned about how particular I live, and so I can live how I want to. I mean, we have people engaged in this country in, in all kinds of wickedness that God clearly condemns. And they believe out of their own wisdom, not listening to the word of God, that God is with them, that God is blessing them, that they belong to him, and that they're certainly going to see heaven. But as long as they practice anything that the Bible condemns as sin, they're just trusting in their own wisdom, and the end of that is death. They need to listen to God. They need to do what he says. So if they don't fear him, they don't respect him, they don't trust Him and His wisdom, trust their lives to Him, do things His way, they're going to end up shipwrecked. They're going to end up destroyed. But there are also those who know the Lord but do not respect Him as they should. And so they don't listen to the Word as they should. But we need to remember in situations like that, because they belong to Him, God is going to graciously deal with them. And we really see that a little bit in the last point. What can we expect if we trust Him and live by His Word? And what can we expect if we don't? Well, Solomon tells us in verses 6 and 8 that if we trust in the Lord with all of our heart, He will make your paths straight. And then he says it will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. First of all, he says He will make our paths straight. Now, that's why we need the wisdom in the first place, right? So we can walk in the straight path, so we can live the right way. Again, think Pilgrim's Progress. As long as Pilgrim stayed on the straight and the narrow path, he was safe. But when he stepped off the path, he got into trouble. Now, this was Bunyan's main point. As long as we live according to God's Word, by trusting in Jesus and trusting what he says in his word to guide us through life, we will make it safely from this world to the next. 
God wants us to be safe. Now remember, that's why he sent his son. It's because of his love, because he wanted to save us from hell. And if we're trusting Jesus, he has saved us from hell. That's why he gave us his word, to show us the straight path so that we will be safe from sin. That's why he gave us his Holy Spirit, so that we would trust in Jesus and so we would read his word and practice what it is he says in his word so that we will be safe. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and he will make your paths straight. But there's a second blessing that Solomon writes about in verse 8, which is a little bit perplexing on the surface. He says it will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Now, healing presupposes some kind of injury, some kind of disease. Refreshment presupposes some kind of parching or dryness. So what is it that Solomon has in mind here? Well, he might have in mind here the healing that the Lord brings to our souls when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. David writes in Psalm 103, verses 2 through 3, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Perhaps he's talking about healing us from spiritual uh, disease that's brought about by sin. He could also have in mind the healing, the turning from our own wisdom and back into his will actually bring because of his fatherly chastisement. Remember, whenever we step off the path, because the Lord cares about us, he will bring correction to turn us back into the way. Now, this correction can come in various forms. We know that it can come in the form of conviction. When you sin, you should feel conviction in your, in your soul. You should feel the Spirit of God telling you, this is the wrong way, get out of it. Uh, this is sin, you've offended God, you need to turn. Sometimes he can bring a conviction that is so strong that the psalmist, David, in this case, can express it in terms of feeling it in his bones. He writes in Psalm 38, verse 3, There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. And sometimes he refers to his bones as being dry and parched as with a fever heat. Sometimes it can come in the form of sickness. Remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthians regarding their coming to the Lord's table with unrepentant sin, something that we've read on numerous occasions. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And then he says in verse 30, For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. They've died. When we turn off the path, the Lord brings discipline. And he brings that discipline in order to get us back on the path. And when we get back on the path, it can remove the discipline and bring healing. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, discipline doesn't always mean that the Lord is correcting us for some sin. Discipline means instruction. It means correcting of behavior. Uh, it's a word that's used simply to teach. And the Lord brings whatever he brings to teach, to teach us something that we need to learn. It isn't always directly related to a sin that we have fallen into, although sometimes it is. And so we need to listen and we need to learn what it is that the Lord is seeking to teach us. Now, we are going to explore that particular theme a little bit more fully uh, this evening. But for now, what I want us to think about is this, that we need to trust in the Lord's wisdom and not rely on our own wisdom, not do things our own way. We need to do things His way if we are to be safe. Live by His wisdom. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will keep you on the straight and the narrow path. But one application of this principle is how we should prepare ourselves to come to the Lord's table. We need to make sure that as we come to the table that we don't approach it in our own wisdom. If we approach it in our own wisdom, we can think along these lines. 
basically the same lines I remember thinking uh, along when, when I was just maybe five years old. And I was in church, and everybody was being served communion. And I didn't know the Lord, but everybody got it anyway. I thought, oh, great opportunity to get a little bit of bread to eat and a little bit of grape juice to drink. And that's how I looked at it, and that's how I enjoyed it. But that's not what the Lord actually says. We can't come to his table thinking along these lines. It doesn't really matter. It's just a little bread and a little wine. It doesn't matter how I'm living. It doesn't matter if I'm believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, if I'm repenting of my sins. It actually does matter. That's what 1 Corinthians 11 is all about. If we eat and drink of the, the table in an unworthy manner, we're eating and drinking judgment to ourselves. And Paul says, for this reason, the Lord has disciplined some of you in the congregation. It does matter. What we need to do is approach the table with God's wisdom. Okay? This is his table. There's a blessing that is here for us. Actually, the blessing comes from our Lord Jesus Christ, but this is meant to get us to look up to him. There is a blessing in the sacrament of the Lord's table if we come believing and repenting. But there is discipline or judgment if we don't come repenting and believing. That's what God's wisdom says. Now, are you going to trust your wisdom or are you going to trust the Lord's wisdom? If you want to be safe, you need to trust His. If you want to be blessed, you need to trust His. If you want that nearness of fellowship, if you want all the rewards we've been talking about, you need to trust His wisdom and do things his way. But in order, of course, to do that, you need to know what he says. So you need to read the Bible. Don't rely on just what you're hearing here. Don't rely on what you hear from other places. You cannot get the Word of God any more purely than simply opening it up and reading it. And make sure when you read it, you read it with faith, trust, belief. This is God's Word. Remember to take it seriously because God takes it seriously. His attitude towards the Word may not be the same as our attitude towards His Word. We need to take it as seriously as He takes His Word. There were those in the Bible who didn't take it seriously, and we see what happens to them. What Solomon said takes place. There's, you know, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Ananias and Sapphira thought it was right to hold back part of the price. And to, to give it saying we've given all of, of the money, the proceeds from the, you know, from the sale of the land, but God didn't think the same way about it. You, you've lied to the Holy Spirit and the Lord struck him down. We need to take what the Lord says seriously. If we do, we'll be blessed because of God's love and his mercy and his abundance. So let's take him seriously. Let's be safe. Well, with that, let's bow and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard from his word, but let's also pray that he would prepare us uh, to come to his table. Uh, let's renew our faith and our repentance uh, towards the Lord.